So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> that would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, broadcast and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and baseball capital of the world, Go Rays, St. Petersburg, Florida. I well remember my first encounter with wireless internet service outside of my home. It was the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association's Wireless 2002 show in Orlando, and I was sent to cover it for Technology Meetings magazine. Boingo Wireless had approached the CTIA just two weeks earlier about making Wi-Fi available at the gigantic convention at the Orange County Convention Center, and I was there to test it out. Wi-Fi changed my life, and the magazines too. My cover story on that, on that event was the last issue in the magazine's short history. <laughs> anyway, I've been sold on Wi-Fi ever since, and I suspect you'll find my guest today is a big fan of it too. He's Dave Hagen, CEO of Boingo Wireless. Dave, welcome to Mr. Media. Thanks, Bob. Glad to be here. Delighted to have you. I, uh, you know, I actually had to go and look that up because it, it was it was so long ago. But um, I remember, yeah, no, I mean, 2002 Wi-Fi was uh, kind of a radical thing back then. Now, were you with Boingo that early? I was. Yeah, I was. Uh, I've been here since 2001. Oh, okay, great. It, it, it was, uh, you know, I, I was not a big tech guy at the time. I've I've, I've always been a you know, I've had uh, I've had my Macintoshes for uh, 20 plus years, but um, you know, was not like on the cutting edge by any means of uh, uh, the whole wi- wireless conversation. And that opportunity came up, and I thought, well, this is cool. And then uh, I, Boingo was giving away wireless at that show, although not that many people took advantage of it because it happened late. Um, what was the state of the industry at that point? I mean, we're talking six years ago, and uh, you know, why was it why was it a big deal then? Well, the wireless internet, uh, you know, has really been a concept. Uh, you know, it, it, back then it was just a concept, and, and you know, people wanted the the power of being untethered, you know, by line or cable um, with their laptop. Uh, but you know, there weren't really many solutions on the market, and so then Wi-Fi came along. And back then we called it 802.11b, if you recall. In fact, <laughs> Wi-Fi was Wi-Fi was. Uh, that kind of a marketing handle that um, some folks had put on it, but it, you know, we weren't even sure if that was going to become the way it was identified. That's you know, this was now back 2001, prior to that show. So what? What? Uh, it was, but as Wi-Fi developed, it became the simple way for people to network multiple computers uh, together at home. Mm-hmm. So that was the real, the first consumer um, demand driver was I've got two computers and. In the U.S., I think the average household with a computer has 2.4 computers. So, thus, the need to connect them together to um, access the the broadband circuit into the home. And so, Wi-Fi was just a fantastic solution to do that. Super high speed, very easy to install, uh, IEEE standard. So, you know, if you bought Wi-Fi gear, it would talk to one another. So, you know, no, um, uh, you know, no compatibility issues. And so from that, you know, that, that simple beginning, networking home computers, it really um, became um, an opportunity for it to be used in commercial applications. And so really the first, uh, the first locations out in what we would call public space or commercial locations, commercial venues, um, a couple airports ended up uh, putting in Wi-Fi. Um, Starbucks was, a, was an early um, brand that, uh, that had Wi-Fi. And this is again dating kind of back to 2001, 2002 time period. So then, you know, people started understanding what it was all about, but the technology and the the equipment had to catch up with the demand. And so, you know, back then, uh, laptops didn't come embedded with a Wi-Fi chip. You had to buy a separate card. I remember when we launched the company in 2001, the cards were uh, north of $100. Um, and obviously now it's pretty hard to buy a laptop that doesn't have Wi-Fi embedded. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as uh, as consumers started to um, up, update their laptops and Wi-Fi chips were embedded, then we just saw this massive movement to wireless connectivity. Again, all enabled by kind of the dual thrust of Wi-Fi chips getting put into laptops, and then more and more networks popping up uh, literally all around the globe. 
Um, did you uh, did you guys think in 2002 it would happen so quickly? Um, you mean to get where it's been, where it is today? Yeah, I mean it, it's now. You know, it's interesting. I, I, there, there seemed to, there came a point where we went from wow, gee whiz, that's cool. I, I hope one day I have access to to it. Now, I mean, you pretty much assume you're going to have Wi-Fi access wherever you go. Yeah. Yeah, we we actually did think that it, it would happen. Um, the time period's pretty close to what we, I guess I would say, what we had hoped it would be back then, because you know we didn't mm-hmm. really. Know. It's always you know technology adoption is a very hard thing to forecast. Um, but you're right. You know, if, you know, fast forward six years to where we are now, and you know, you're pretty hard pressed not to have a Wi-Fi signal if you're you know inside some type of a building or infrastructure. So you know, I think it, I think it has matched our expectations. I think what we're really looking forward to now is the next wave, which is Wi-Fi chips being embedded into all sorts of um, non-PC devices. So the obvious things here are um, cell phones, so smartphones. Um, obviously, the iPhone has Wi-Fi inside. Most of the major handset manufacturers are now shipping uh, with Wi-Fi chips. So. Nokia has been an earlier uh, has been an early adopter of Wi-Fi into into their mobile handsets. Um, Motorola, Samsung, HTC, Sony Ericsson, uh, you know the Rim BlackBerry. So the Wi-Fi chip, just like what happened in the PC, um, you know, circa 2001, 2002, that's now happening in the handset market. Hmm. Uh, Dave, there's a uh, we may have a call here, or this may be a coincidence. Let's uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Hi, do you have a question for Dave Hagen from Boingo Wireless? Okay, and we'll just leave you back where you were. Sorry, Dave. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, maybe it's the name Boingo, but I, I've always imagined that this was a fun company to be around. Well, uh, hopefully, it, it was and still is. So we take <laughs> pride in uh, we take pride in, in in innovation and being a leader in the space and, and having this idea of what we call network aggregation, which means um, partnering with anyone and everyone who is deploying a Wi-Fi network on a global basis. And we have 150 of those operator relationships around the world, and so that a Boingo user, a Boingo account, um, can literally move from location to location, and hence the sort of the springiness of the name, Boing, Boing, Boing. <laughs> that, was the, uh, that, that was where the um, original idea came from for the name. Of course, the uh, the line you're using these days is "Don't go, Boingo," right? D- don't just go, Boingo. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> how um, how uh, how? What's the growth level of the company these days? I mean, is the world saturated with this already, or do you still have a long way to go? Well, on the network side, as you mentioned earlier, you know, most places you go to, there, there's now Wi-Fi, you know, inside the building. So, from a network growth perspective, you know, I think we're probably maybe 80% along the way. So, you know, most places have it, whether it's an airport or a hotel or, you know, a coffee house, uh, convention center, you know, those types of places where um, typically want, people want to get connected. But on the, so on the network side, I think we're, you know, getting to relative uh, maturity, if you will. But on the demand side, on the device side, you know, it's, we're, frankly, we're just starting. You, you, you look at the numbers um, in comparing non-PC devices with PCs, so uh, more specifically laptops. There are about 200 million laptops in the world, probably a little bit more than that. Um, but in the handset world, there are over 2 billion handsets in the world. Wow. So, you know, a much larger market opportunity, and those handsets get replaced um, about 50% each year. So... Uh, there's over a billion new handsets sold each year, and that number keeps rising. Mm-hmm. An increasing number of those have Wi-Fi chips. So we're really, I just think of it as the second wave on the demand side. So we've got a great business at Boingo. Uh, today we're growing 50% year over year. We're um, cash flow positive. So, you know, we've gone from early stage venture back startup that consumes cash to a um, you know, a good business, a growing business, and a um, a positive income business um, to a, a company that has just an amazing opportunity to help people get these 
Wi-Fi enabled devices, these smartphones connected to this global wireless internet. So that's the next phase of our development. Has the change from, uh, now I, I keep going back to this point in time that is a, is a touchstone for me, 2002, but has the change in uh, use from, uh, you know, laptop computers getting uh, the, the wireless uh, uh, to being a, a BlackBerry and, a, and a, an iPhone world, has that had, has that had an effect on, on the way your operation is set up or you're able to supply uh, uh, Wi-Fi to, to, to any device? It doesn't really matter. Um, from a network perspective, it doesn't really it doesn't change. Um, the Wi-Fi network interacts with the Wi-Fi chip. But what, what we have focused on doing, and it becomes even more important in a smartphone world, is on the the software applet that makes it easy for you to connect to these networks. Because if you, you think about the difference between a handset with a small screen, you know it may have a, a QWERTY keyboard, it may not. So you know typing in username and password and uh, typing in your credit card number, you know, through a forced browser or a walled garden page within a venue is pretty is pretty difficult, much harder than it is on a laptop. And so, to um, to eliminate all of that sort of user difficulty, we've created a little software applet, um, part of Boingo Mobile, that the user can download onto their handset. And once you've set it up, so it has my username and password stored in it, I can just get connected. Um, at any of these hotspots around the world, and I don't have to worry about um, creating a separate account, whether it's a, an AT&T location or a T-Mobile location or a Boingo location or a British Telecom location, et cetera. Uh, Boingo just makes it easy if you get connected to that Wi-Fi network. So it's the software development that's been really um, a, a big focus of our um, uh, research and development efforts over the last few years. I think I always thought that the the weakness in the whole system in the early years was that if you you know if you desired to connect to the network and to have that Wi-Fi, but you didn't really know what you were doing, it wasn't seamless, and you had to rely on the barista at uh, Starbucks or uh, uh, you know somewhere else, and and those people just didn't know what in the world you were talking about. No, that's that's exactly right, and so we've really focused on. Uh, making Wi-Fi easy, and so that's really our position. We want people to think, when they think Wi-Fi, we want them to think Boingo, and we want them to think, well, Boingo makes it easy for me to get connected wherever I am. Hmm. What are some of the, on the commercial side, so people can recognize as they're traveling, um, you know, when, 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 I'm out, when I'm out and about, what are some of the bigger commercial uh, uh, destinations that you have uh, relationships with, or that your carry your your partners have relationship with. So if I'm out and about, where am I going to run into Boingo service? Uh, if you're just out and about town, uh, the two sort of iconic brands would be at uh, Starbucks and McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So those uh, all have Wi-Fi now, or, or the vast majority have Wi-Fi, and and uh, Boingo your Boingo account works in those locations. Uh, if you're traveling by air, you can use your Boingo account in literally 85% of the airports on a global basis. So mm -hmm. the airports are very well covered. Um, on the hotel side, uh, the same thing. Um, most hotels that you would go into, you'd be able to use your Boingo account. So it's, it's, How it's, did – go ahead. It's, it's really – it's pretty much everywhere you go, whether you're, you know, a, um, a commuter, you know, just where you, where you stay within your city. There are, you know, lots of places around town to get connected, you know, Barnes & Noble bookstores, um, coffee bean and tea leaf, you know, you know, down from the the larger brands that we mentioned earlier. There are just you know lots of opportunities where you can just get, get connected around your community. And if you're a traveler, you know, we we specialize in that, and we've you know really got the travel ribbon as we call it covered. Dave, am I am I wrong in in, uh, in surmising that uh, when uh, when Boingo uh, replaced T-Mobile in Starbucks, that that was a pretty big deal in the company? Yeah, we didn't actually replace T-Mobile. Uh, AT&T did. No? So, oh. yeah. So, so AT&T won that business, but, but uh -huh. the Boingo account works on the uh, AT&T network. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but still so a big deal for you guys. <laughs> very big deal. Uh, you know, we've, we've wanted to um, uh, get our customers access to Starbucks. Obviously, uh, you know, fantastic brand and, you know, as Howard Schultz says, the third place, right? Homework and then Starbucks. So we definitely, <laughs> we wanted to have Boingo users to be able to use their accounts there. And 
Uh, we try. We've consistently tried to do that for the last literally seven years, and we finally were able to make that happen as uh, AT&T won that business. So I think you know, kudos to AT&T for having an open network strategy, and they've been a great partner of ours, and we continue to, to love working with them. Let me say, uh, if you're listening and you've got a question for Dave Hagen, uh, CEO of Boingo Wireless, give us a call, 646 646- Five nine five three one three five. There's a big difference in the way uh, Starbucks and McDonald's treat wireless. I mean, if I go into Starbucks, uh, I've got to have a, uh, an account. Uh, I've got to be paying for my wireless. If I go to McDonald's, it's free. How, how do you weigh those two? I mean, how do they affect your business? I actually think it, it depends. Most of the uh, most of the McDonald's are pay networks. I think there are a few where maybe with a purchase you um, you get free access, but for the most part it's pay. Um, you know, different sort of different setups. Where in Starbucks, you know, there are ways you can get free if you if you buy their um, loyalty card, mm-hmm. Starbucks card, then you can get some uh, access on a daily basis. So, and you see the different business models in, in Wi-Fi developing. Um, you know, the carriers like to bundle it with um, another service. So, you know, AT&T bundles it with their home DSL service, as an example. Um, I think you'll see the cable companies starting to come into um, Wi-Fi. Uh, Cablevision uh, is deploying Wi-Fi networks, Wi-Fi uh, access points on, on Long Island. Um, and so, you know, I, I think you'll see all sorts of different business models uh, end up being developed, um, whether it's a bundling strategy, a standalone strategy like Boingo, I think you'll see some free advertising supported or sponsor supported models um, you know but but in general, I think that's healthy keeps the ecosystem lively and and uh, keeps innovation happening so I think it's a good thing is it uh, is it a big deal between c and i want to make f e e and free f r e e in terms yeah. of the in terms of what you do pay pay versus free yeah i mean obviously we're yeah. um we're more on the pay side, so you sign up for Boingo, and then you can use uh, Boingo um, for pay. We have done some uh, free uh, ad-sponsored uh, sessions in, in the airports that we own and operate, um, and so you know customers tend to like that, and, and we uh, and we use the ad sponsorship to to um, defer part of the cost with the with the access. The challenge is in those models is making it economic so that it actually is a sustainable business. And I think um, if you've if you've been out and used some free networks, um, you may have experienced uh, sort of the reaction. Well, this is free, but it's not very good. And I like the free part, <laughs> but I don't like the uh, the poor quality or it's slow or you know if there's a uh, an adver- advertisement on the front end, it doesn't load very quickly and sort of bad user experience. And so. It, what we've really focused on is we need to have a great user experience, and then that needs to be an economic model so that we can continue to invest in the infrastructure to continue to make that a great experience. And, and it, I think you'll see um, there's some fallout for the really small operators who have been trying to make free networks work because they, they start out without, without a lot of bandwidth. They end up attracting quite a few users, and that user base grows, which then reduces the quality of the network, right? More people sharing the same network, it gets slower, but they don't have a, a revenue model or a business model that allows them to continue to invest in the network. And so you end up with a lot of unhappy users using a really poor network, and that doesn't benefit mm-hmm. anyone. So the, you know, the, the, the challenge, I think, for those folks is to figure out, is there an advertising model that will work? Is there a sponsorship model that will work? Um, so that they can maintain quality. And, and as I said, we've done some experimentation there, and it's it's tough. It's tough to make the economics work. That's the challenge. I think mm-hmm. if you look at you know other businesses that have uh, other access businesses that have tried to go free, it's pretty difficult. You remember the um, free ISP days? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know from from Net Zero, and you know there are certainly a bunch of others. Um, it, you know it looked like a really interesting model back in the bubble. But at the end of the day, didn't really pay for the cost of providing the service. So you know those, you know the free ISPs either went away or became for pay models. Um, the Muni networks, Muni Wi-Fi networks, uh, you, you saw the same thing happen. There was cities, uh, there was high interest in cities 
trying to uh, bridge the digital divide. They wanted to bring free Wi-Fi um, to their communities. But at the end of the day, uh, I think people realize, I think the operators realize that uh, we can't really provide an adequate service by not uh, by not charging for it. And so most of those have gone by the wayside as well. Well, I was going to ask. I was going to ask you about that because I, I know where I am in uh, Saint Petersburg, Florida. They, it seems like it was about a year or so ago. They were putting out for a bid, and and there were companies coming in, and and, and you know they said, oh yeah, we're going to build this wireless, free wireless. Uh, so you know, anytime you're downtown, you'll have. And then it all seemed to have gone away. And I, I think the biggest example may have been. Philadelphia wasn't Philadelphia going to enact a big, a big system, a big free Wi-Fi system, and then it just kind of crumbled suddenly. It just wasn't going to happen. Yeah, and, and they're not alone. It was, um, uh, you know, Philly. I think Anaheim was a leader. You know, San Francisco with a, a Google Earthlink partnership made a lot of headlines probably now three years ago. Right. Yeah, the, the networks either didn't get built or they got built, and then were pretty quickly shut down. When, they, when, when the operators realize there's not a business model here. So that's the challenge. You know, everybody loves free, but, you know, you, someone's got to pay for it. Someone has to subsidize it. So the question mm. is, you know, what's the business model that works? I guess when uh, uh, Google backed away from uh, establishing free Wi-Fi networks around the country, that should have been the, the, tip, of, the tip off to everyone else that it was not going to work. <laughs> right. No, I, think, I think you're right. Um, Dave, uh, I've got a question from the, uh, the, speaking of free, the free web chat that accompanies Mr. Media Interviews. Um, one of our uh, listeners wants to know, uh, as a user, he says, I'm still frustrated going from place to place. Uh, how about some more interoperability? Well, that's, um, I, don't, I assume the, the, the caller is not a, um, a Boingo user, but that's exactly what we do. So Boing, uh, Boingo has um, what we call roaming relationships, but uh, you know, interoperability is, is a part of that. And so your Boingo account will allow you to access um, uh, Wayport, Ibon, AT&T, uh, T-Mobile, um, in their airports, uh, you know, uh, Surf and Sip, uh, you know, 150 different operators um, literally around the world. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's our role in the ecosystem, and so I would encourage you to give it a try. That's been a big uh, change too in the industry, hasn't it? Been that that the the, uh, the Wi-Fi carriers, uh, such as Boingo and others, are are they're operating more uh, hand in hand, hand in glove, if you will, as as the the the, uh, the cell phone companies had to learn to do years ago, because all of your customers were getting were unhappy that they'd go from place to place and they'd have to start over again or have multiple accounts. Yeah, I mean it, that was really you know Boingo's. Um uh, reason for being, you know, Sky Dayton, our founder, you know, that was his his vision for the company is you're going to have this unlicensed spectrum, this Wi-Fi network capability um, just growing all around the world. And the challenge is that these are individual networks run by individual operators. And so the real, the, the real um, consumer value comes from making it easy for me to move from one network to another. And so that's I mean, that's what we're all about at Boingo. That's what we do. And, and you're right. The the analogy to the cell phone business is uh, is a good one. You know, when when uh, you know 20, 25 years ago. In fact, I think the um, anniversary of the first cellular call is now just about 25 years ago. There was a party a couple of weeks ago um, honoring that event. But you know, in the early days of cellular, you could use your uh, cellular phone or car phone back then only in your community. And if you went outside of your community, then it probably wouldn't work. Um, and then, of course, uh, people, uh, the cellular carriers put together roaming agreements. So then the challenge was, well, technology works, right? I can now drive outside of my city or travel outside of my city, and my phone will work. But then the problem was the commercial one, which is the roaming rates are so high. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think it was um, AT&T with the one-rate plan probably – 10, 15 years ago that really simplified pricing, and uh, that's when the cell phone usage just took off. So, you know, in any networking business, right, the, the power of the network is based on the number of different users that can get onto that network and, you know, the network effect, and that's happened in cellular, you know, it's happened in Wi-Fi, 
and it's really what Boingo's role in the ecosystem, the Wi-Fi ecosystem, is all about, being able to use one account, um, one, you know, one credit card account, one username and password anywhere you go in the Wi-Fi ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, that's really made the difference in terms of travelers and making it easier to use these services. Uh, um, uh, our, uh, one of our guests, again, in the, the web chat asked a question that I was wondering about. Um, what about WiMAX? And, and is, it, will that, is, that kinda, is, is that technology, uh, is, it, is it going to happen? Is it going to be useful? Uh, will it affect your networks, if, it, if so? Uh, it is happening, and uh, I would say it is useful. So uh, Clearwire is, um, has been the early uh, leader in WiMAX in North America, Craig McCaw's company. Uh, they mm-hmm. recently you know, did a, um, a merger with, uh, with Sprint and the Sprint Zone network. Uh, so that joint venture is coming together, and I think they just deployed uh, Baltimore as their first uh, joint market. So WiMAX is rolling out. Uh, it's probably in 25 or 30 markets in North America. It tend to be um, smaller markets to start with. That's where Clearwire's focus has been. Um, and it's good technology. It, you know, it works. It's much like cellular um, uh, though it has higher bandwidth, um, but also building penetration is a little challenging. So uh, Wi-Fi in a building uh, will continue to be the stronger network uh, to get connected to. So think of WiMAX as another cloud network, much like a cellular network over a city. And mm-hmm. Wi-Fi uh, as a spot network, hotspot network, if you will, inside buildings um, you know, where people are stationary. Any concerns that all this, uh, uh, I don't want to sound like a kook here or anything, but all this uh, Wi-Fi flowing through the air, the WiMAX, et cetera, that, you know, the, on top of all the cellular and the radio waves from, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the 20th century, uh, that, you know, any of this is dangerous to people, you know, as we keep adding to what's going through the air? Well, I'm, I'm clearly not the right person to ask. I'm not, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not, a, not a doctor and not a scientist, but... Um, you know, certainly uh, there have been lots of studies on it, and I don't think there's been anything uh, that has been definitive that has pointed out that uh, based on the low power that all these networks run on and these devices run on, that there's any uh, human health risk. But again, okay. I'm, I'm probably not the right person to answer that. No problem. I just thought I'd throw that out since we're chatting. Um, well, just a couple more minutes, Dave, if you will. Um, um, what uh, you know? What's what's ahead for, for Boingo? What, what's the next uh, evolution of the service? Uh, either you know that the consumers will see will see, or on the network side. Yeah, the the next evolution is uh, what we talked about at the beginning of the of the interview. So moving beyond the laptop, um, mm-hmm. as Wi-Fi chips get in put into um, all sorts of different devices, whether that's a smartphone handset or a game, uh, a gaming device, or any other, frankly, any other networked device that has a Wi-Fi chip in it. And so our goal, our vision is to be able to get all these various um, Wi-Fi enabled devices located onto this global network that we've put together through partnerships. So again, you know, we've, we've had a great time uh, surfing the first wave, which was laptops. And there's just a much bigger wave coming, and that's uh, that's all these different uh, Wi-Fi enabled devices. So pretty pretty exciting times here at Boingo, and uh, look forward to um, watching that all come together. I'm thinking it would be uh, silly of me not to ask you a financial question or two before you go, seeing as how we're we're doing this on a day when again the market was down. I don't know. Last time I looked. 400, 500 points. You know what's what's four or five hundred points among friends. But um, <laughs> how uh, you know how well positioned is Boingo for all the upheaval? And uh, you know is 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 Wi-Fi one of those one of those uh, places in terms of internet service where it's still growing so much that no matter what's going on out there, that you know maybe you're 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 well positioned no matter what. Yeah, and I'll answer it uh, sort of in two parts. One, just the general health of the company. Uh, we're growing very rapidly. We're cash flow positive, so we're generating um, cash flow instead of consuming cash, and we've got a very strong balance sheet with cash in the bank and, and no debt. So, you know, in terms of um, you know earlier stage companies where you know with the with the um, private equity markets and the venture capitalists um, really tightening. 
uh, down on investments, um, Boingo doesn't need any additional money to continue to um, thrive and survive. So, you know, from a, a state of the business, um, you know, we're, we're in great shape. And the second part of that is um, back to uh, back to devices. And uh, what's interesting is um, Wi-Fi chips are getting embedded into smartphones and other devices. So they're coming to market. That goes beyond the economic turmoil that we're in. And so, you know, think of it this way. If handset, if global handset sales drop by 20% over the next year because of tough economic times, so people hold on to their existing cell phone a little bit longer, there is still a huge number, right? It's over a billion new handsets that will be sold, um, even with a decline. Uh, and, and we're going to ride that wave. So to a certain degree, the, the growth opportunity um, with dual-mode handsets is such that it's not really driven by the, the economy. So from that perspective, we're in good shape. Certainly, if business, traveler, uh, if business travelers slow down, um, our laptop business could, um, could slow down a little bit as well. But we're, again, mm-hmm. well-positioned and uh, generating cash flow, so we're, we're prepared to weather the storm if we need to. Very good. Well, um, folks, uh, check out Boingo Wireless's services when you're on the road. You may be doing it and you don't even know it. Uh, you can also visit the company's website at www.boingo, B-O-I-N-G-O. <laughs> I always feel like I'm going to have to sing a song when I say that. <laughs> Boy, boingo.com. And uh, Dave Hagan, thanks so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Good luck. Okay. You too. All right. Folks, uh, for dozens more celebrity and media newsmaker interviews, surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com. That's where you can listen to my previous conversations with people like Billy Bob Thornton, Cheryl Hines, Jeff Garland, Robert Schimmel, Bruce Davison, and even, yes, Kirk Douglas, among many, many others. Please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, DigitalJournal.com, Podcast Pickle, Vox, Folio, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zencast, Audio, the Kindle Reader, or iTunes. And if you've got an idea for a guest for Mr. Media, email me directly at bob at andelman, A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N dot com. As always, thanks for joining us today. I always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day to spend it with us. Come on back and see us again soon.